David, thank you so much for being here. For everybody watching, this is Dr. David Perlmutter, who I admire so much. Um, he's a functional neurologist and the author of multiple books, including Brainwash, which is behind us, which just launched today, which is very exciting. So thank you for being here. We are 12 hours into it. That's awesome. Um, I know at the birth of something that took you know two years coming out today must be a very exciting time. It is, and you know this is a book that I wrote with our son, uh, who is a medical doctor as well. And what a terrific experience that was! I mean, to be able to uh, work with my mentor, my son, and uh, you know create something new based on a, a whole premise that we kind of stumbled upon when we were sitting around our feet up, and we were talking about our frustration that uh, we would do everything we can to learn as much information as we can. Read the books, go to the courses, go to the conferences, learn as much as we can to help the next person. Then we meet one-on-one -on -one with a patient, we give them, we transmit the information, and then nothing happens. So we realize that there's a breakdown in the system, that we part A, part B work great, but the, there was a disconnect between information and action on the part of our patients. And we realized that you know, we as physicians, healthcare providers, tend to blame the patient for not doing what they're told. I mean, it sounds sort of uh, almost parental, what you are told to do. Right, what, but patient non-compliance, exactly, right? Exactly, which is huge. <laughs> and maybe 50 to 80% of information that patients receive, they don't follow through on. And that said, uh, we realized that it would be really helpful if we could take a step back and look at what goes into that decision-making process. Why are they not following through? And even transcends the doctor-patient relationship to anyone who may want to better himself or herself, goes out and buys a book. You know, you know there's wonderful books out there right now. It's actually looking at your bookshelf. You've got terrific books there. And how many people buy these books and yet that's as far as it gets. So, you know, my books, everyone's books that are great are useless to these people by and large until they implement what the book is talking about. And that might be keto, paleo, it might be a vegan diet, whatever it may be. But if, it's, if you don't implement, if you don't take action on the information that you have, you're not going to reap the benefits. So we began exploring what goes into our decision-making process. And we realized that uh, if we could figure that out, then it would be a, a kind of a higher level of information that then allows people to implement all the great information they're getting from books, they're getting from you, they're getting from the internet, wherever they may get it. And we realized, learned that there are really two areas in the brain that are involved deeply in our decision-making process. And that is the prefrontal cortex, the part up here in the brain that lets you look at information, uh, weigh that information, and then make a balanced decision not only for what you want to do, but also think about how that may play out in the future, tomorrow or 10 years from now, versus uh, an area called the amygdala and other areas of the brain that favor more impulsive types of momentary decisions, uh, glazed donut, end of story, right? We know where that goes. And then we realized that there's a balance between the two, and there's actually a connection between the prefrontal cortex top-down control on this more impulsive area of the brain. And we really need that connection between the prefrontal cortex to act as the adult in the room, to rein in that impulsivity so we can, in fact, utilize the prefrontal cortex, make better decisions. And we recognize that so much of our modern world now is threatening that connection. We call that disconnection syndrome, and we explore that deeply in the book. So what threatens then our ability to keep the adult in the room, to utilize the prefrontal cortex and make better long-term decisions? And surprisingly, what we learned was so many of the trappings of our modern world are designed to take us away from being more thoughtful, uh, including our digital experiences, which directly are designed to uh, make us impulsive. The clickbait, the pop-up ads, the next cued a video on YouTube, for example, is all designed to tap into your impulsivity, your fear-based part of the brain, and keep you away from the prefrontal cortex. That lack of restorative sleep does the same thing.
The next day, you're more, much more impulsive. That an inflammatory diet, more Western type of diet, keeps you from connecting to the prefrontal cortex. Uh, that lack of exercise, lack of nature exposure. So this became a, a really powerful knowledge set when we realized that what's going on globally with our lifestyle changes is locking us into an impulsive, fear-based, us versus them, narcissistic part of the brain. As opposed to being able to access the part of the brain to make good decisions for ourselves and for others by enhancing our ability to be empathetic for others, for ourselves in the future, and even for the planet. And so we developed this theme of disconnection syndrome. And then after we called it all out, you know, what goes on social media and lack of sleep that's so encouraged these days to be productive, stay up late and work hard, burn the midnight oil, meaningless crap. We decided to provide, you know, later in the book, okay, problem and solution. What can you do then to offset what's going on around you? A, recognize it and B, let's engage in these things to reconnect the prefrontal cortex allowing me to reconnect to you. So of course now I need to know what we can do <laughs> because the modern world seems so, it's charging forward without you know, really much we can do about it. It's a train we're all on and it seems like global warming and devices and how much time we spend engaging in devices and information, it's, it's only getting worse. It's true. And what do you do? You write a book exactly about that. That's what we did because we need to stop. We need to reconnect to each other. We need to reconnect to ourselves and make better decisions. And we need to desperately reconnect in an empathetic way to the health of our planet. Um, I'm, I'm not saying anything that people haven't heard before, that's for sure. But I think the connection that we're making is how the world around us is actively hacking into us to rewire and restructure and refunctionalize our brains for a negative outcome. And it, it is what it is. We're putting a positive spin on it. And now you ask that question, so what can we do? So there are various on-ramps back to making better decisions. And let's just start with our digital experiences. Uh, I'm all in for my technology, love my technology. We wrote a book just now, Brainwash, based upon unlimited access to information because of the internet, how wonderful that is. But on the other side of the coin is a mindless uh, utilization of this technology that allows my brain to be captivated by pop-ups, by clickbait, by the next cued YouTube video that happens to be interestingly, and how did that happen? Something I might be interested in. Who knew that could be, right? We know very well why and how that happens. So as it relates to using, for example, uh, our digital world being in front of a screen. We have great benefit. It's a very useful servant, but a dangerous master. Uh, that was said uh, by Christian Lang in 1921 when uh, he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, a, a useful servant, but a dangerous master. And I think that let's use it, let's allow it to serve us, but let's not be used by it, which is what is happening. And so we developed in the book what we call the test of time, and it's an acronym, TIME. T-I-M-E. How much time do you allot right now for the project that you want to accomplish? You want to learn about something, how much time will that take? How much time do you want to go on social media and connect with friends and family? Fantastic, go for it. But how much time are you allowing for that to happen? You know, it's been said that when you have five minutes to spend on Instagram, it's a great way to spend 35 minutes, <laughs> right? We all know yes. what I'm talking about. So time is the T. I, is it intentional? What is your goal? What do you hope to accomplish? M, do you remain mindful while you're having this experience? Are you engaged and mindful of all of the things that are attempting to harvest your attention? Because there's great value in where your eyeballs go online. There's great value to others, not necessarily for you. And finally, E, is it enriching? Do you feel better after the time you've spent uh, online or do you feel like, gosh, I just wasted whatever that length of time was? So. Again, it's not to be, um, you know, a castigating technology. We love to be able to hail a ride from a stranger or order dinner, whatever it may be. That's great, but it has to be reined in. So 
the connection between the prefrontal cortex and this amygdala or our impulsive behavior is really what separates people from those who actually accomplish lifestyle change and can make these things stick in their lives and those who can't. So, So you get one night's bad sleep. You don't sleep one night. You're up for whatever reason. Uh, the next day you are dramatically more impulsive. We all know that. We all know that our food choices are inappropriate the next day, right? Mm -hmm. You can't rein yourself in. We've all experienced that. How ironic it is that for me as a physician and even MDs coming up through the ranks today during residency, we basically don't sleep. And yet we are called upon to make life and death decisions every day. And we're kept up for 80 hours, 100 hours a week. Research shows that even one night of non-restorative sleep causes a dramatic increase in amygdala activity the next day. Uh, the study was actually done where people were challenged with a, an image of, of a photograph of a face of somebody being threatening. And if you had a good night's sleep, well, you saw it, whatever, maybe your amygdala lit up a little bit. But if you didn't get a good night's sleep, then that was dramatically fear-inspiring and your response was significantly different. So uh, not only do you have much more fear-based behavior, but your impulsivity gets ratcheted up significantly to the extent that we know that with people who chronically don't sleep well, they may consume as many as 300 extra calories each day without a similar increase in their energy expenditure. So net positive 380 calories, when you recognize that uh, it's only 3,500 calories for a pound of fat. That's a pound every 10 days uh, or more. So it doesn't take long to realize how poor sleep translates to increased body fat, which does what? It increases your likelihood of not getting a good night's sleep. And what does that do? Further impulsivity. And the main mechanism that disconnects the prefrontal cortex from the amygdala, allowing the adult to be in the room, is inflammation. And this is the same inflammation that you have explored extensively that's related to things like coronary artery disease, diabetes, cancer, and Alzheimer's. That's the same player, inflammation. Now we recognize that chronic inflammation is threatening our behavior, is threatening our decision-making. We've talked so much in the past about our de poor decisions in terms of what we eat, in terms of not getting a good night's rest, poor decisions leading to inflammation. Now we know that inflammation is enhancing poor decisions, and that creates a very damaging, vicious cycle that people have difficulty getting out. Of. You know, it's a feed-forward cycle. So what we've talked about in Brainwash is any on-ramp that you can take will pave the way for better decision-making and ultimately allow you to bring on board more of those activities to further reconnect you to the prefrontal cortex, reconnect you to the part of the brain uh, for better decision making, for more empathy, for more compassion, and you know, for a less fear-based us versus them kind of appreciation of the world around us. So I know that it's very multifaceted, the different components that help to strengthen this connection or undo the disconnection syndrome. Is there a pecking order? Are there any that are really front runners as far as if you can get this right, you're going to strengthen this much more than just trying to do it all at once? Because I know a lot of my audience likes to start one place. <laughs> What's the one thing you can do? Not the one thing, but where should I start first? Like If I feel completely overwhelmed, which they seem to all do because everybody feels like they have no time, and I could only focus my efforts, you know, in this one area. Let's start there and see if I feel better. And then that would encourage me to sure. do. You know. Well, there are two answers. And the first is really, it, it's good for each individual to focus on what is the most askew in his or her life. And uh, having said that, I think the, the two most powerful, uh, as we call them, uh, entry ramps or em entry points to getting back on the carousel for better decision making turn out to be sleep and our digital experiences. Not that exercise, eating a low inflammation diet, uh, reconnecting with nature, meditation aren't incredibly important. You bet they are. But I think what is so pervasive now is the level of non-restorative sleep amongst Americans in particular. At least a third of American adults do not get restored. And in Japan, it's two thirds. 
do not get enough restorative sleep. And that has immediate implications as in the next day, as we talked about, being more impulsive. At the same time, getting a good night's sleep the very next day is, uh, is very, very empowering. So that, you know, you're talking, you're wanting one thing. Uh, if I, we could make a magic pill, you know, that, the reconnection pill, that would be what the pharmacist would love to do. Uh, there is no such thing, obviously. Uh, but I think if people want to really leverage something would be, look at your sleep hygiene. Are you using computers that are on a screen in the evening, getting blue light to inhibit melatonin, not sleeping well? Are you drinking caffeine because you're running down the batteries at three or four in the afternoon that will then compromise your sleep? Uh, what are the things that you're doing that are keeping you from getting a good restorative night's sleep? Now, you may not know. I was just about to ask you. I knew that. It's a stupid question, but sometimes I wake up and I'm not really sure if I had a good it's night's sleep. It, it's true. You may not know. I mean, you may think, uh, you may say, you know, David, I sleep eight hours a night and yet your sleep may really be compromised because you don't get enough deep sleep, for example. That's the time when you activate the glymphatic system and clean out the garbage. You may not get enough REM sleep, so you're not able to process and contextualize your experiences in memory. Sometimes I wake up, I knew that there was something I was thinking about, that, you know, something during the day that was a thought, but I can't tell if it was just in a dream and therefore I was deep sleeping or if it was sort of waking me up a bit because I was worried about it and therefore not having deep sleep. The truth of the matter is, Right now, this is a dream and you're going to wake up and <laughs> go, God, I remember that podcast. I wish we could do that again. Inception. Uh, well, the reality is that you don't know and you need to know. So there are wonderful wearable devices out there now that can give you some idea as to what's going on. Uh, I happen to use an aura ring and I think it provided me with some extremely valuable information because I've thought pretty much that I'm a good sleeper. But you don't know if you have uh, sleep apnea or your your periodic leg movements that are waking you up or not fully waking you up, but dragging you out of the deeper stages of sleep to more superficial sleep that is not as restorative. How would you know? You can go to have a formal, what's called polysomnogram at a doctor's office and learn about it. So it's really good to get some feedback. I cultivated some changes in my uh, sleep habits based upon the information I got. My Deep sleep I did not think was enough. Uh, when I started using the Aura Ring, it was about 47 minutes. I wanted more. And I realized that even just checking email uh, after dinner was not a good idea for me. Now, for you, it might be something else. It might be changing the time of day that you exercise. Uh, who knows what it may be, but being able to have that feedback is really great because you can make changes, have a single variable, make a change, and then see what that's like the next night. And it's really good to know. Your partner may know that, uh, you know, may, may say that you snore a lot, you stop breathing, you're kicking the bed sheets or whatever it may be. And that's good information to have because if you have these leg movements, they may be arousing you and pulling you out from those stages of sleep that are really important for you. It has been said a few times I've, I've spoken in the night and I have no idea or I, you know, thrash around with covers. I, that is, I, I had no idea. Sometimes I think I have a great night's sleep and I've had all this activity. So good to know formally through something like the aura ring what is really going on that's just right anecdotally and from him it's tough but underrated in our society you know you don't spend eight hours eating or exercising right but every, that that gets all you go online but everybody's talking about eat this don't eat that and whatever it'll clean your colon or it'll make you smart whatever it'll do but you know the truth of the matter is you don't do anything for a third of your life like like sleep would normally involve think about that and yet no one really wants to talk about it. So we're, we're really getting to the point now, uh, Why We Sleep, a wonderful book by Dr. Matthew Walker. We're really getting to the point now of really getting our arms around sleep as being critical. And now in our new book, we talk about why it's so important for reconnecting to the prefrontal cortex to offset this connection syndrome. You mentioned diet, so I feel like I have to then ask you about it because you've also written so many other books about the connection between brain health and diet. Um, would you say that's sort of the second most important thing right now that you're seeing? Again, it's tough to rank. It really depends on the person. And I would say that diet is a huge issue, uh, not just for uh, us, but globally. Uh, we talked a while ago about how inflammation, this process that we're all familiar with, chronic inflammation, so demonized and rightfully so, 
uh, when we recognize that the number one cause of death on our planet are the chronic degenerative conditions, according to the World Health Organization. These are inflammatory disorders. So the number one mechanism that causes us to be dead is inflammation. What can we do to look at that and recognize where it's coming from? And diet is a major source of that inflammation. Uh, foods that are increasing inflammation are foods that are more highly processed. The ultra processed foods, the uh, simplified carbohydrates, obviously the sugar, many additives, artificial sweeteners as well, interestingly through mechanisms that involve the gut bacteria. But the Western diet is a pro-inflammatory diet and therefore is disconnecting people from their prefrontal cortex. It is fostering impulsive narcissistic behavior and an us versus them mentality around the world. The Western diet is becoming the global diet and it's changing how our minds work around the world. Now, look at what's going on around the world. It's not necessarily a pretty picture. Am I saying that it's just because of diet? No, I'm saying that it looks like you know, the mindset of people globally is changing and I think diet is playing a role in that. And I think I'm standing on pretty firm ground having walked you through it just now. Uh, but it is something that can be changed and my hope is will be changed. But, you know, what is really relevant here is that we call out all of these entry points that are leading to this disconnection through the mechanism of inflammation, whether it's diet, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, lack of connection to nature, uh, lack of connection to each other as both a cause and a manifestation and you know look at again how we can offset so because you focus so much on the health of our brain specifically i just wanted to ask if the diet that you've you know researched and spoken about and informed all of us for years and through so many books that is best for brain optimization as well as avoiding some of these brain diseases like alzheimer's and dementia is really a similar diet to that of you know, it strengthening is. your... And you know what? It's, it's similar to what most people are writing about today. And whether it's uh, keto, paleo, vegan, whatever it is, uh, somewhere in that book is going to talk about this diet lowers inflammation. That's our goal. Uh, Grain Brain talked about the, the threats to our brains of a highly refined uh, carbohydrate, for example, and sugar. Uh, and that was through the mechanism of inflammation beyond Grain Brain. Then Brain Maker looked at diet, but through the lens of our gut bacteria. How do our dietary choices influence the health and diversity and functionality of our gut bacteria? Why? Because that's where inflammation begins. So it refined the diet a bit by adding more uh, nutrients that nurture the gut bacteria. In other words, prebiotic fiber. Uh, and in that book, we also began to emphasize again uh, the importance of uh, various essential fatty acids like DHA. And those are the uh, points that we leverage moving forward because they're really deeply involved in reducing this process of inflammation. The role of essential fatty acids, the role of catering to our gut bacteria, and finally, the very clear and present danger of consuming refined carbs, sugar, and highly refined foods. So you mentioned keto, vegan, paleo, those sorts of things. Will you share your general philosophy on the diet that's best for brain health? And you probably don't have one set diet. I don't believe that there's one diet for everyone. And I try to explain this to my audience because I interview so many different experts. You know, how can this esteemed MD be pro-vegan completely and this other one be, you know, pro animal products exactly. And the reason is because they're focused on different parts of the body. You know, what might be amazing for brain health is not necessarily exactly what you know, cardiologists are focused on and things yeah. like that. Well, uh, criticize me if you may. I'm saying that more to your viewers. Uh, but I, I think there are some broad strokes that transcend everybody's unique perspectives. And those are that the diet should accomplish the tasks I just mentioned. It should be focused on nurturing the gut bacteria and reducing inflammation. And how you go about that can be brought about by a more vegan-based program. Uh, or a more keto-based program or a paleo program, whatever. But that has to be the end game. So there are some broad strokes, I think, that uh, should transcend the particulars of any unique diet. I would say that my trend has been more to plant-based in recent years. It doesn't mean that 
uh, animal-based products are literally off the table because there are not. Uh, I think there are wonderful ways to be um, not particularly uh, totally vegan and yet still accomplish an incredibly wonderful diet. I think that diversity in foods is really important. Uh, diversity in the nutrients they contain, but also diversity in a more broad perspective uh, with respect to color. I think perhaps the most under-recognized nutrients these days are the value of the good fats and also dietary fiber. There is a trend these days, or something that's becoming trendy anyway, of being carnivorous, and almost to the exclusion of anything plant-based. And uh, call me out if you will, but I don't think it's, it's a sound advice. Uh, if we are looking at a paleo perspective and asking ourselves what did our ancestors consume, they consume both plants and animal products. And uh, we need dietary fiber to nurture our gut bacteria and to amplify its metabolic activity and its diversity. Diversity of gut bacteria, having different species, uh, creates resilience. Much as diversity of the flora and fauna in the Amazon allows the Amazon to be resilient to environmental threats, we need diversity of the human population to be resilient as well. Uh, but that said, uh, I think there's huge value in dietary fiber. Uh, we are really getting to a point of finally understanding how the type of fat we consume is so darn important. Uh, and we just got to the point of saying, well, you know what? The idea of low fat, no fat was kind of bogus. We now understand politically why that was accomplished. Uh, so maybe fat's an, an all right thing. Uh, but now we're at a point of saying specifically, yeah, fat's good, but what type of fat should we be emphasizing? Why are the omega-3s, why is DHA, EPA, and DPA, the of pentaenoic acid, so important for our health? And in an inc incredible convergence of information for me, how EPA and DPA and other omega-3s seem to be uh, beneficial, a, a new thing we've just discovered is how they influence what's called the endocannabinoid system. Everybody's talking about cannabinoids, CBD oil, you name it, you know, mm -hmm. CBD oil in a bagel. Well, that's not exactly what we're talking <laughs> about here. And the point is, if you're taking something that's supposed to be good for you, why would you mix it in a brownie with three tablespoons of sugar? Oh, but it's organic cane sugar. No, it doesn't matter. It's sugar. My point is, though, that we're just beginning to understand how the endocannabinoid system works, why things like these endocannabinoids, uh, anandamide and 2-AG, how they work in the body. And um, it's incredible to look at the interplay between omega-6s versus omega-3s in how they affect uh, the endocannabinoid system. In terms of inflammation, look where we've gone. We've gone full circle now. We're right back to that mechanism. Yeah, so healthy fat, I mean, I know we talk about it so much at Wellbe as far as how important it is for all kinds of diet, for blood sugar regulation, for, for brain health. But I think people are still, you know, confused. And I'm glad that you just came right out and talked about it, um, about whether or not, you know, they, they can eat meat or should eat meat. And I interviewed Dr. Kelly Brogan, integrative uh, psychiatrist, and she doesn't let people go through her program that are vegan. She says, you know, there are parts of you know, you need some of the animal fat for optimal brain health and therefore, you know, just it has to be part of that diet. Um, and then, of course, I've interviewed some other integrative cardiologists who said we've got to get meat out of the diet. And most, I think, people today see for the planet that a reduction in meat is critical. We call for one meal a day to be totally plant based. Uh, and, you know, and it shouldn't be a surprise, but it, it is a bit of a surprise for people who thought that grain brain was simply Atkins diet redux that were back to the idea of, you know, bacon three times. a day. We never went there. It was pretty much looking at the value of, of vegetables even then, but saying um, that certain types of fat are threatening and that refined carbohydrates and sugar are to be avoided, are toxic to the brain. And I want to get back to a point, Adrian, that you mentioned earlier. And that was that the notion of a, a heart smart diet might not be a brain smart diet. And think about how silly that is. And, it and seems impossible. Of course it is. <laughs> how counter to a holistic perspective could you get? Now that we recognize 
that the heart and the brain and the gut and the kidney, everything is intimately connected. I just edited a book that came out uh, a month ago called The Microbiome and the Brain, relating the gut and its contents to what goes on in the brain. And what a notion that the gut, that gastroenterology is somehow related to neurology. You know, you go to a cocktail party, the gastroenterologists are there, neurologists are there, cardiologists are way over there, and we're all involved in the same thing. You know, this is a reductionist mentality that is pervasive now that is made worse by, I think, the pharmaceutical kinds of mentalities of creating a specific drug to treat a specific problem. We're not Newtonian billiard balls. Uh, we recognize that, gosh, you know, we talked about cholecystokinin as being involved, uh, that it, it involves the gallbladder. Well, it has roles to play in the brain. We talk about progesterone, pro meaning for gestation. It's a, a hormone that goes up during gestation. Well, why do I have progesterone receptors in my body? So when things get labeled, they get segregated into compartments and yet they have effects throughout the body. What goes on in the gut intimately affects my brain function moment to moment. How my heart works is intimately affected by my level of meditation and the depth of my sleep. So uh, I think we have to get back to a notion of integration uh, and holism as it relates not only to my body and its functionality, but to how we function in an integrative way as a society, how what you do affects me, how I affect you and people in other countries and how we affect uh, the planet. So that is called empathy. Yes. And empathy is, uh, you know, this ability to recognize the feelings of another person, but also to take another perspective, to take that person's perspective, to see the world through his or her eyes, uh, which may be a different perspective than I have. It means reaching across the aisle, as it were, which isn't happening very much anymore. The polarization that we see, not just in Washington, but around the world, is pretty uh, deep uh, and is being entrenched by what people do online. Because people tend to gravitate to those social media sites uh, that share their mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, that these are the like-minded individuals. We watch this news network only or because that news network is saying things that are just totally off base. I'm not taking sides here, but I'm saying it's very valuable for us to visit another person's perspective. That's how we make progress, because if we're always looking at things the same way, we can't advance. I see the polarization even within this integrative functional medicine world, especially medical doctors had to be trained in specialties. You know, you can find research that supports an argument in a lot of different scenarios and it doesn't mean that the other person is totally wrong because they're only focused on you know brain health and this person's only focused on heart health and they're not really reaching across the aisle to say how what is the research that we both share like how can we both be right and not so much like this is dogmatically how you have to do things because all you should care about is your heart absolutely not if your heart is in great health but you have mental illness or gut dysbiosis, who cares? It's really uh, breathtaking. For fun, sometimes I go to specialty uh, conferences or lectures that have nothing to do with my area of expertise. And you know, it might be a GI conference, a renal. I, mean, I just listened to a, a podcast about kidney health. And I, I immediately recognized a parallel between what they were talking about and Parkinson's. And I got home and Google, I said, is there this relationship is, are there a gene uh, morph polymorphism SNPs that relate to what that guy was just talking about and Parkinson's and sure enough, there it was. And wow, that closed a really important circle for me. We need to be closing some circles, wrapping our arms around things uh, in order to be more inclusive as opposed to exclusive. I want to get back to brainwash and um, the idea that there's a disconnection between our prefrontal cortex and our impulsive behavior or the amygdala part of our brain. I think in the book you mentioned that there were eight elements of things that really caused this disconnection and therefore things that we could work on that would um, help to strengthen that connection. We talked a lot about sleep and then we talked a bit about diet. Um, what are the other six? The other six are things that people have probably heard about, exercise as it were, 
It turns out that exercise is very helpful in terms of reducing the stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol also threatens to disconnect us. And exercise, we know, helps to reduce inflammation. And inflammation, as also mentioned, uh, is helps to foster disconnection. Um, and I want to just for a moment digress uh, and recognize one other part of inflammation that's really, I think, needs to be vetted. And that is that inflammation actually changes our neurochemistry in a negative way. There's something called the kynurenic acid pathway, whereby higher levels of inflammation tend to reduce the conversion of tryptophan into serotonin. So less serotonin available for the brain and actually increased production of chemicals like quinolinic acid that can be threatening to the brain. So yet another reason why inflammation is something we want to downregulate. We really emphasize the value of meditation. Uh, the research has been going on for at least a decade that shows if you want to light up the prefrontal cortex, meditate. And that the benefits in terms of increasing connectivity persist long after your 15 or 20 minutes of meditation each day increases the more that you do it. Reconnection and, and actually making yourself engage with other people has a, a positive effect too. The more you do something, the more those pathways uh, get energized. Uh, we do spend a lot of time in the book talking about the value of reconnecting to nature. Uh, when we recognize that 87% of the time uh, that uh, of Amer Americans' lives, adults, are spent indoors. 87% with another 6% spent in our cars. Doesn't leave a lot of time to get out in nature. Nature reduces inflammation. Nature reduces cortisol. Nature fosters less impulsivity, better connection to the prefrontal cortex. And nature has its own interest. Nature fosters a concern for the natural world. So it's a feed forward process. And, you know, we all don't live next to a park or can't take a week off to go to Yellowstone every month, and it may be as simple as having a plant in your home, and it may be as simple as even a photograph of a natural environment. Those have positive effects on resetting your connection. Uh, very, very important. So these are the big players, and um, we add to our recommendations the idea of expressing gratitude. Because like anything else, through what we call neuroplasticity, the ability of the brain to form new connections. The more you do something, the easier it is to do that thing. And that has a lot of positive uh, blowback in terms of restructuring your brain. I talk a lot about that. It has been amazing for me to see having a gratitude practice change my whole day when I do it, you know, first thing in the morning and how much the blue ocean effect for me, you know, seeing open ocean immediately calms me and changes my perspective on myself. My day can make me more empathetic, compassionate, um, puts things And it may be other things for other people. Some people it's a mountain, some people it's trees, some people it's caring for their bonsai in their living room. Like you, for me, it's the ocean. I mean, I, I, uh, I live on a boat uh, for four months a year. And so I'm direct, and, and my, the window of our, where we sleep in the boat is maybe this high, maybe three feet above the waterline. So we're real connected. Um, but everybody should find what, uh, what floats their boat. <laughs> At least I'll drop that one in there. Well, I have really, really enjoyed this. And I feel everything that you've described are a lot of the things that we already work on at Wellbe. And as you said before, these are not you know, huge revelations that nature is important or diet is important, but it's more so that you're seeing that there's a physical aspect of the brain that's causing a lot of the issues around, you know, quote unquote, non-compliance or being apathetic or not sticking to lifestyle changes, which we're filming this, you know, in the middle of January, even though it might air later in the spring, but that's something people are really focused on right now is resolutions and changing habits and, and also beating themselves up when they don't do it. It's so important we stop the self-blame. I think it's so valuable for people to understand from the get-go that the deck is stacked against them, that the world is conspiring for their attention and their decision-making, not for their benefit, but for the benefit of the people who are making this happen. And I had an interesting thought as you were just speaking, though I was listening atten uh, <laughs> intently, that Frank Lloyd Wright said that form follows function, right? But as it relates to the brain, function follows form. 
and we can reform the brain for better function. And that's what these activities do. Yes, people have heard about exercise, eating right, getting sleep, all the things that we mentioned. But as we look through these recommendations through the lens of this higher order being able to make better decisions moving forward, that becomes the empowerment part. And as we talked about earlier, it doesn't matter where you jump on the carousel. It might be by paying attention to your sleep, changing your diet, getting out into nature, whatever it takes to get you a little bit better in terms of your decision making, that will be feed forward and translate into better decision making across the board. I think it's very empowering, honestly. I think people sometimes hear a long list of all the things they need to change their whole diet, getting into nature, you know, this, that, not being in their car, they commute a long time, and it feels like, how am I going to do all those things? But when you put it in the perspective of changing those things, then rewires your brain to make it easier to do those things, right. and it doesn't feel so overwhelming. I think it's much, it's a much better sell for me at least, and I'm sure for a lot of people in our audience. You know, you start the lawnmower and you pull it, nothing happens. You pull it, finally you pull enough and it starts to go on its own. Yes, I can make better decisions, and that continues. Then you make better decisions across the board, and it's all about empowerment. You, you said it well about regaining control, uh, really reconnecting and you know, making those decisions that have been so frustrating for so many people who've blamed themselves. And we're all into offloading that blame. It's not entirely your fault that you can't follow through. We want people to regain that ability. Okay, a very last question for you that I ask everyone on okay. The Wellbe Show. Um, our website and all of our social channels and everything is Get Wellbe. Um, and I think it sort of signifies like you said, a sense of empowerment, you know, wellness and good health doesn't happen, it takes a lot of work, especially in the modern world. Um, so I want to know, I mean, I'm sure you do a lot for yourself every day, but how do you quote unquote, get well be like, what is your absolutely can't miss couple of things that no matter if you're traveling home on a boat, you know, wherever you are, you will make sure to do for yourself to stay well. How I get well be is uh, number one is gratitude. To me, uh, gratitude transcends the, the meditation, the sleep dedication, the exercise, the dietary stuff. Uh, that is what is most fulfilling for me. And as I engage in gratitude, it then makes me uh, able to do all the other things that are on the checklist. Do you often do your gratitude exercises in the morning or do you have a specific way that you do it or just all the time? It's the first thing that happens when I wake up. I mean, just to wake up in the morning you have to be grateful for that, right? Yeah. Another day has been given to you. So it's the very first thing, you know, and, and then all the thoughts flood your mind in terms of what you got to do and all, and all the, you know, your busy day. But to take stock of gratitude and feel it, uh, and be with it, let it permeate for me, let it permeate my body in the morning, uh, really sets the stage then to be able to engage, uh, to be grateful for the physical body that I have allows me to exercise. For the mind I have allows me to, um, to meditate. For the mind I have, grateful for, I'm a little bit clever, I guess. Uh, and because of that, we have gratitude that I can express my thoughts. Grateful that you want to hear what I have to say in this moment. That people around me want to hear my words and, and read my book. Not everyone, that's for sure. But for those, those people who think that there's value, I'm really gr grateful that I've been gifted the ability to look at information synthesize it and make it understandable by others. Oh, well, I'm very grateful that you are sharing all of that with me today and that you're here in person. It's always great to connect in real life. I feel life. gratitude for that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much again. This has been uh, really thank wonderful. Thank you, Adrian.